We'll get started. <laughs> Hi everyone. I think we can get. I think we can get started. Um, welcome to Caring's uh, Women in Motion talks in Cannes, which sheds a spotlight on women in the arts and culture. My name is Minori Ravindran, and I'm international editor for Variety, based out of London. Um, I just wanted to say I'm so so thrilled to be here. I mean, it's a, a so such a privilege that we're all together again after this last year. But also, I'm just so excited to speak with Jody Turner Smith, an absolute queen who I have admired for so long, and um, just very excited to dig into this conversation because um, you have been, you know at the forefront of so many very interesting roles in the last couple of years and um, just off screen as well, a very um, you know amazing voice in the industry. So thank you for being here with us. Thank um, you. <laughs> I'm sure that everyone in the uh, room is probably very familiar with Jodi's roles, but just to sort of um, to, to go through um, Jodi's breakout really was the 2019 film Queen and Slim opposite Danielle Kaluuya, which is absolutely fantastic. Danielle um, Kaluuya, woo! So good. <laughs> Total legend. <laughs> Um, and then obviously you were starring in Amazon's Tom Clancy adaptation of Without Remorse, which came out earlier this year with Michael B. Jordan. Um, and she stars in the, the beautiful film uh, that is actually playing in the Cannes in certain regard uh, section um, by uh, Coco Danda after Yang, which I actually saw a couple of days ago. Um, and it's, it's so lovely and, and great. And you were fantastic opposite Colin Farrell. Um, yeah, so I mean, I just wanted to sort of start, I guess, because you had a very unconventional sort of role, or path, I should say, into, into acting. You started um, in finance, really, right? Before yeah. moving to kind of like up and moving to LA. And Middle market corporate banking, yeah. as exciting and thrilling as it sounds. <laughs> that is... That yeah, I'm is, sure it's exciting for some people. It wasn't exciting for me. Of course. And, and can you talk a little bit about sort of, you know, the, the decision to just sort of move change your life completely, move to a different state, get into yeah. modeling as well? I mean... Yeah, I mean, I just, you know, uh, when I was working at the bank, I looked around and I saw that there were some people that were really excited about what they were doing, and I wanted that feeling, you know, and so I knew that I had to leave and figure out what it was that made me feel excited. You know, I felt like it was possible to, to enjoy what you did, and especially when you look, you turn around and you see that, you know, I mean, I was getting up before the sun to go to work, and sometimes leaving work and the sun was down, and so it's, you know, you're spending all of your time, most of your time doing this. And so I wanted to feel excited and thrilled and happy by what I was doing because I, know, I knew that that's what I would be spending most of my life doing. And so I thought, you know, I'm, I have nothing to lose and everything to gain by just trying to figure it out. And so really moving to LA was, was more of just this beginning of that quest. I mean, and even starting modeling, it was, it was definitely something where I wasn't certain whether that was going to be the path for me, but I, I knew that I needed to try, you know, and figure it out, because if I didn't, then I would always wonder. And did you enjoy your, your sort of your, your modeling years? Was that, did that come I easy did, to you? you know, I think for me, when I started modeling and, and the moment where I was, when I did it and I thought, oh, I found something that I really enjoy, I think what I didn't even connect at that time was what I loved was the performance aspect of it. Mm. Because the first time I ever really had the feeling where I was just like, oh my God, I'm in love with this, was doing a fashion show. Mm. You know, and I think there's that, you know, it, there's, there's an element of feeling like, you know, you're on a stage, people are watching you, there's a performance really. And I think that was what, and then I think, you know, because then, as I was a model, you know, and, and most of you, did, did any of you see me in, in fashion magazines? Very few of you if, you, if any of you did. And because I wasn't really ever a super successful print model, I was always a very successful commercial model. Mm. And so there was, again, it was really about that performance aspect, you know, and even that's what people were drawn to in me. They loved to hire me for television commercials because I was always, it was something about the performing element of it. So, and I think doing it as well, it, it gave me, it was, it's just one of those things where, you know, there's always, when you look back in your life and you're like all these little steps that led you to where you are and, and made you what you are now. And I think it was so much about doing that. What modeling gave me was, was learning how to be in front of the camera and to feel comfortable there. You know, and also to deal with lots and lots and lots of rejection. <laughs> I <will> imagine. <laughs> and so it was 
I guess, a, or an organic pivot to, to TV then. Yeah. Um, and what were like those early years of sort of, you know, gigging and trying to, because you, you started properly in TV. There were a few yeah. good TV roles there for you. Were, was it easy to break through? I mean, I think that, as I said, so I'd, you know, I'd been doing the television commercials and, and in, in LA and in the business, once you start doing television commercials and their, uh, you know, union, then you get your union card. And so before I was ever really like a proper, you know, actor and I was just a sort of a commercial actor, I was in the union and I was living in Hollywood and I thought to myself, again, having this sort of philosophy about having nothing to lose and everything to gain by just trying things, I thought, let me just see what would happen if I started submitting myself for roles. And one of the first things that I ever submitted myself for was this role on True Blood, which at the time was an extra role. And I submitted myself and it, you know, they called and they said, you know, we've actually turned it into a, a, a principal role because you'll have one line. And, and so they were like, well, you come in and read for the producers and the director of the episode. And, and so I go in and I read my one line, which was to say William Compton three times. <laughs> And they hired me on the spot. And I was just like, OK, this is what happens when I just like throw this whim out into the universe, right? And I, without any sort of you know, effort behind it, what would happen if I put effort and intention behind this? You know? and, and from there, you know, I started to work, you know, acting classes, you know, auditioning, talking to people, just trying to glean all of the experience and information and practice that I could that would lead me to the next thing, which was, you know, then I got this, this role on, on this TV program that it was a remake of a British television program Mad called Dogs. Mad Dogs. <laughs> yeah. And I was working with these amazing actors that were so experienced. And it was, you know, we were shooting this pilot. And so it was one month in Puerto Rico. And I was just like, that was the first experience I had where I was just like, I feel like a real life actress. You know, I was on location and I was there for, and it was probably also the first time in my life where I've listened more than I spoke because I just wanted to be a sponge and take it in. You know, I was working with all of these actors who had between them over a hundred years of acting experience, you know, Romney Malco and Steve Zahn and Michael Imperioli and Ben Chaplin and Billy Zane. And they were just all so wonderful to me, especially Romney and Michael. And, and really in a way, you know, I, I'm, when I think about sort of a, a mentor in a way like Romney really kind of was that for me because he would always, you know, even though I had in that show, I think it was two scenes in that episode. I mean, he just showed me like what it was to have a work ethic and to practice and to really like think about the work that I was doing and how to attack it. And it was just such a beautiful and nurturing experience. And I feel like, again, it's that thing where every experience sort of leads you into the next one. And I also feel like, you know, because things definitely happened in a way that is not conventional, but I feel in my egoistic way <laughs> that it's because I'm connected to purpose. You know, it's because I found something that I'm supposed to be doing. And so I'm finding that it's leading me from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next, and, and building this beautiful little journey that has landed me here 10 years later. <laughs> 10 years later, wow. I mean, I mean I, the, but that first, I mean, Mad Dogs, I think that was 2015, I think mm, that was. Mm. So, you know, I mean, not, not so long ago. That's not, no, that's like, you know, what, six, six years effectively, yeah, yeah. right? Um, that's an incredible kind of meteoric rise, I would say. <laughs> and, but obviously the game changer there was probably Queen and Slim, right? Can you yeah. talk a little bit about how you kind of came to work on that project? Because that yeah, was absolutely. really groundbreaking. I auditioned a lot. <laughs> you know, and that's the thing, I think when you're an actor, they, they put out loads of hoops for you to jump through. Um, and in a way, I, I feel like, you know, I always feel like auditioning is sort of like the hazing of, of acting and it's so nerve-wracking and it's like, and it's nothing, an audition is nothing like being on set, obviously, you know, you're imagining so much of the circumstances, which, I mean, you obviously have to do as an actor anyway, but there's so much to sort of overcome when you're in an audition that yeah. is, is irregular in a way. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I remember that... I saw in, it may have even been Variety, <laughs> that this Daniel Kaluuya was attached to this project that Lena Waithe was writing the script, that it was going to be Melina Matsugas' first feature. I'd actually worked with Melina on a, a television commercial uh -huh. years before that. Uh -huh. And I remember I, I reached out to my team and I was like, what is this? I want to be a part of it. And what's crazy is that I had just shortly before that had had a general meeting with a casting director, Carmen Cuba, who had somehow wanted to meet me. And 
she was the one who was casting this. So I was like, wow, this seems like the star, like the stars are aligning in this moment. And you know, I read the script, and when I read the script, I was just absolutely floored by that script. You know, I was blown away by the story, and I was just in love with the character. I just, I just really loved who Queen was, and I really wanted to play her. And you know, it's as I was saying before, when you do modeling, you get used to rejection, and in acting with auditioning, you have to be able to just sort of audition and then walk out the room and, and let it go because you may never hear anything ever again <laughs> about that. But I was so attached to this, and I think I cried in my car after every single one of those auditions because I just felt so connected to the project and so in love with the story. And you know, I, I, I auditioned for Carmen, and then I auditioned for the producers, and then I auditioned for for Melina, and then I did a chemistry read with Daniel. And I remember at the end of the chemistry read, they were like, "Can we just take a picture of you guys?" together and I I didn't even you know in my nerves in my just totally melting down I didn't think that meant anything like you know I, I, and you also just learn to also not think anything of anything because <laughs> you don't want to be disappointed but they took a photo of us together and that was the picture that they posted like after to say you know that they had found their queen and they're ready to do this movie and it was just the whole thing was exhilarating and emotional and intense and Amazing, you know. So you've literally been a queen since since day one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, did the doors open for you the way that you know maybe the industry that you yourself thought? Like, I mean, what were the opportunities like after that film came out and uh, the types of roles that you were getting? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think Queen and Slim definitely made a lot of people who didn't rate me or didn't know who I was or or didn't know what I could do look at me differently. Mm -hmm. You know, I definitely was in so many conversations that I was not in before that and I would not have been in without it, you know. There's never really a way to quantify exactly how much things change for you, especially because, I mean, I did that film and then I went on to do another one and I was pregnant and it was all these things, I got married and, and so in a way, life was moving so quickly for me in my own little bubble that I didn't really have time to sit there and think about like, oh, this is how things have changed for me. You know, I actually didn't, you know, when the, as the film was being rolled out and I, you know, I was flying back from Berlin to promote it. And so I never really was in L.A. to even see billboards or anything like that. I didn't really experience that whole like, oh, this is a moment your life has changed. It was literally just like I was just trying to get through the next thing, you know, but I, I definitely felt as though the conversations around me in the business were different. And, you know, I think just in general, work begets work, right? Mm. And, and my whole thing was, I mean, even when I got Queen and Slim, I was like, right, don't fuck it up. <laughs> you know, I'm like, <laughs> now I have to show up and do the work. Right. And continue to do that, continue to show people that, like, I can do this work and I'm going to grow and learn. And, I mean, I, I, I think I learned so much and grew so much doing that experience. And, and that's really the way I look at everything, I mean... I always say going into a project, I wonder who I will be at the end of this because I think you become something more, something expands in who you are and what you're capable of. And really that's just the main focus and the goal is, you know, not what opportunities I have at the end of this, but how am I different and who am I and how do I take this new person into the next thing? Of course. Um I mean, I wanted to, to ask about Anne Boleyn, obviously, which yeah. is a recent TV, so you've sort of come back to the TV world, yeah. just, you know, obviously for, for this, for this. so I live in London, and this was a, a drama for Channel 5, uh, the broadcaster, which hasn't really done a lot of drama, this is, this is sort of new to them in the last couple of years, they're doing this big, you know, so it's announced, big historical drama, Jodie Turner-Smith playing you know, a, a black actor playing a, uh, a, you know, a very white Tudor queen, you know, <laughs> yeah. and the British uh, public, I think, can be very opinionated about, you know, his, their period dramas, and specifically, you know, your casting in this role was a bit of a, you know, I think it, I, I remember seeing the backlash online, I thought it was brilliant, but, but, you know, obviously a lot of people had problems with that, it doesn't very happen very often in, in British TV where you have, um, you know, people of color, to be honest, playing historical figures like this. Why did you, you know, why did you want to take this role on? Did you, did you have a, any sense that there might be some, some pushback in, in the UK when it, when it aired? Yeah, I think, you know, 
I definitely anticipated that there was going to be people that felt a certain way about it, you know, that people were going to feel strongly about it. I mean, number one, obviously people are very attached to the Tudor era and very attached to all of the characters and, and historical figures in, in, in that era. I think we've seen for years and years that in theatre, you know, we have characters being played by people of all different ethnicities, but I think definitely in a medium like television or film, it's something that we, we see much less. But I thought it was so interesting that the, uh, the, the producers wanted to do something where they did this sort of identity conscious casting instead of uh, you know, casting somebody based on you know, what color their skin is. I think that you know, it's when anybody feels very strongly about something, and attached to something, I'll say, you know, people really feel very strongly about Anne Boleyn one way or the other, mm. you know, whether they believe that she's got six fingers and she was a, you know, a, a harlot and, and slept with her brother, or they believe that she was murdered by her husband, you know, people feel strongly about that. And when you feel strongly about something, you have a, an image of it created in your own mind about it. So when something is presented that, you know, c bumps up against that image, you know, there's going to be a reaction. And I think that's completely understandable, you know. I think it is the function of art to tell stories in a way that push people to see things differently. I think as a black artist in this uh, moment and time, I definitely want to be a part of showing people a world that looks different than what they have historically been allowed to see. <laughs> Obviously, actors of color and black actors have historically been excluded from playing many, many different kinds of roles, which has made film and television look very homogenous and very white for a very long time. And, you know, the idea is, is to not make the world limited, but actually to make it larger and to show how when you put somebody of color in a role like that, you're actually distilling these things down to human emotion and experience and seeing how it actually is so relatable in a way that is universal. And if people would allow that in, and maybe they might see and feel that. And really, that was the hope. I knew that some people would just not want to participate because they would be against that anyway. And, and those people are going to be against it, whether I was playing Anne Boleyn or, or somebody else. You know, some people are very attached to seeing the world in the way that it's always been shown, even in, in the fact that the way that the world has been shown has oftentimes been not a reflection of the way the world actually looks. And that's fine, you know, but the hope is that perhaps you change someone's mind just a little bit, perhaps you expand someone's world just a little bit, perhaps you make somebody who has never felt seen feel seen just a little bit. And, you know, I feel like I did that. So I was proud of it and I was not afraid of what people were going to say about it because it's impossible to erase whiteness and that's not the goal here in any way. You were fantastic in it. Thank um, you. You really were. I was wondering, I mean, in terms of, you know, Actually, just even a couple of nights ago, I was at a dinner where Kingsley Benadir, uh, who played Malcolm X in, in um, Virginia Kings, who's actually going to do one of these talks as well, one night in Miami, she, um, you know, he was saying how he was, fantastic he was, he was yeah, he really was. Um, but he, he, you know, he mentioned that there was some sensitivity around him as a, as a black British actor sort of take, taking on this very iconic sort of American uh, figure. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and then he was very grateful to Regina for, for casting him in that, in that role. Um, and, you know, even when, with Dan Kaluuya, basically, and, and taking on uh, Judas and the, you know, and the, and the black priest, the black yeah. side, that I think that, um, I, I think that they, um, similarly, he, he got some pushback as well for, for these, you know, for, for some of those, those casting um, choices. And obviously there are opportunities, but, but in terms of, in terms of being a black woman, a, a black actor in this, you know, in this industry, do you, do you feel sort of similar kind of, I mean, I, obviously I know that you've grown up in the, in the U.S. as well, so, yeah. you, so you, you are very, very much U.S. and U.K., but um, have you ever felt sort of some of that, that tension at all? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've seen the conversations, I've mm -hmm. heard what people's, you know, issues are with that, and I, and I completely, again, I completely understand it, and especially, I think we have to understand, is like, this is a product of, and a function of, also white supremacy, because when you have already that black people are being excluded from so many roles, and there's going to be an attachment to, you know, a particular kind of black person being allowed to play the role, it's like, you know, now it's, it's causing 
our community across the diaspora to feel a need to com compete with each other and not based on what we really were seeing, but really what's been created from the outside, you know. But I understand it, you know, I think, and I think, you know, the important thing is that for, I think, for a black actor who is not from the US to, to display a level, like, the, to, to make it be understood that they have a reverence for the story that they're portraying. You know, I think when you approach that, and, and, and so when you talk about, you know, Daniel playing Chairman Fred Hampton, you know, Daniel approaches everything that he does with respect and reverence. And that is always my goal in playing a role, and whether I'm playing actually a, a British person or I'm playing an American person. And I think the important thing, I, you know, I would love to see for all of us in the diaspora to play all of the different cultures there, because I think, you know, while there are these unique experiences from country to country, we are connected, you know, in our roots. And I think the more that we get to know each other, and we have less separation, and we don't allow white supremacy to separate us, then we will all feel a part of these stories, whether we come from Haiti, or from England, or from Jamaica, or from America, you know, that there will be a unity, and a respect, and an honor, and a reverence telling these stories. And I think that's the most important thing, you know, and to have respect for the fact that there is a struggle. At the end of the day, black actors in America struggle to have representation, struggle to get work, struggle to tell their own stories. So there's going to be a sensitivity and attachment that says, no, I only we can tell that story, you can't tell it, you know, but the idea is to come to that place and come to that storytelling with love, with, with empathy, with compassion, with respect, with the utmost reverence, and to, and, and to involve every community whose story that we're trying to tell, make sure that the people from that community are involved in that storytelling so that at the end of the day, we all feel seen. Absolutely. Um, and to that point as well, you know, in terms of being a, a black actor in the US and UK, we saw the Black Lives Matter sort of, which you know, people say the Black Lives Matter of 2020, but actually it's it's it has <laughs> it is a you know, it has longevity and yeah. it sort of it, it sort of was back in the spotlight, I suppose, um, after the murder of George Floyd. There were a lot of promises made by the studios, the streamers, um, you know, black tiles on Instagram. There was a lot of performative um, exactly, exactly. Um, do you feel as though that has panned out? As have, have people lived up to those commitment, you know, promises that they made? Um, how does it, how has it manifested in, in your opinion? Um, I think there's a lot of living up to do. You know, there's a lot of work to be done, and I think that, just like with anything, I mean, when you call somebody out, there's going to be a level of people that there's going to be people that are genuinely wanting to make a change. There's going to be people that are performing, you know, their allyship. But you're, what, what we're doing here is we're trying to change something that's been a norm for a very long time. So even sometimes I think there's, it's, it's about keeping the awareness alive and, and reminding people that it has to be kept alive. I mean, look, I think what's missing and what I, where I see a lot of work still needs to be done is that studios, the business, the industry, everybody has to understand that being an ally is going to cost money. You have to put your money behind it. It's not just the words will not suffice. You know, when you make mm -hmm. casting choices and you hire actors of color into something, you have to hire people who know how to do their makeup, who know how to do their hair, who know how to light them properly. You know what I mean? All of these things also have to feed it. You have to f hire producers who understand their needs and who understand what kinds of stories we're trying to tell and how to honor those stories so that you don't end up with things that feel like tokenism or strange stereotyping or just leaving out people and excluding them. There's so many times where it's like, okay, we're gonna tell a story that involves black people, but there are no black people in the writer's room. Mm -hmm. There are no women in the writer's room. There are no, you know, there's, there's so many different elements of it and all of those things mean money. Hiring the people that are necessary, you know? If you hire a black person to play a character in an action film, you have to hire black stunt performers of their complexion. You know, you, there's still a lot of blacking up that happens in the stunt in business. You know, I mean, there's just so many levels to it, but it's, it's really easy, you know. 
on the heels of the death of George Floyd, it, be, it, was, it suddenly was in vogue to say that uh, anti-racism was the goal, that people wanted to be the allies, but it stopped, it ended there, you know, because reaching into your wallet and your pocket is a lot more difficult than just posting something on your Instagram. And really it's about not just actors of color and people of color holding people accountable, but it's about white people holding people accountable. White people who are in executive positions saying, this isn't okay and we have to change this. You know, that we have to put people who are black also at this level and understand that, you know, this is not just about, okay, this is affirmative action, this is um, meeting a quota, this is... Because, first of all, if we, we can agree that historically any person of colour who even reaches the level to be qualified for that has had to work twice as hard in order to even get there. So isn't that person qualified anyway? So what if it is somebody being hired on the basis of what colour they are? How they've had to work to get here, isn't that person qualified anyway? Perhaps even overqualified? So, you know, it's just, there are just so many different things that feed into this. And look, people are used to, as I said, you know, they have ideas in their head of what the world looks like. And we're going up against those ideas. We're pushing against those ideas. It's going to take time for people to really release and be able to see the world in a different way. And so it means constantly breathing down the necks of the establishment, you know. Totally. And do you, do you see, like, I mean, I was thinking of the, the case of that difference between the U.S. and the U.K., like Sandra Oh, you know, last year at the start of, of Killing Eve of Korean, you know, Korean descent. She's Canadian. Um, she's obviously, you know, that show is labeled as, you know, <laughs> diverse because, you know, because of her prominence on the, on the program. But she spoke about, you know, looking you know, when she's in, <laughs> looking at the people behind the camera and it's a, you know, it's a sea of white faces and that yeah. show is obviously filmed in, well, it's infra international, but effectively UK. Um, do you see any differences between, between sort of the types of crews that you're working with in the US and versus the UK? Is there... I mean, honestly, I think in general, below the line is always very, very white. Mm. You know, it's always very rare to see black crew members, crew members of colour. And I mean, it's definitely, I think, you know, in the limited amount of times I've worked in the UK, because really Anne Boleyn was the first time that I did a, a fully just UK production yeah. of a UK television. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's, it's very white behind the camera. And, you know, and part of that again, so this is what I mean about putting money and resources there, you know, because a lot of times the feedback that you get when you try to bring in, I know some, what a lot of the feedback I would get oftentimes when I would even just try to bring in somebody for hair or makeup who was a person of color, it would be like, oh, well, they're not qualified enough. But it's like, we're not training people of color to do this. We're not giving them the opportunity. We're gatekeeping them from getting into these. And, and we have to invest money into that. You know, there has to be money that's invested into changing the way it looks behind the camera. Because you know how it is on, on these sets as well. It's like you get one job and then it's that that helps you get the next and the next and the next. Mm -hmm. If we're not letting people in the door, if we're not creating the opportunity, then how are people supposed to get there? If we're not training ADs of color, how are they supposed to get there? Absolutely. So you would get pushback when you would suggest, oh, this person or this person I want to work with. Oh, and bring them all the time. And the number one thing is always like, they're not qualified. But then I would, they would hire a white person who had literally had never been on a set before. That happened to me when I was doing a production in Ireland. You know? And those things are just like, make it make sense. What production was that? Are you able to say? <laughs> I'll, I will leave, I will, I, will, I will not say what production it was, but yeah. That's shocking. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Do you think, like, has that been recently, like in like the last kind of year and a half, or was it, it still just... It still happens. But now it's like the fight at least, I, I would say now the percentage of time where the, the fight ends more in our favor is, is going up, right. you know? But it still always has to be an argument. Right, right, right. It still always has to be a push which is something I don't understand. If you have someone who, in front of the camera who is a person of color, why wouldn't you have people in the crew that have an understanding of what they need? 100%. Because it, what, it, what it comes down to as well is when, you know, when you're training hair and makeup artists, they're not trained on texture hair like mine. They're not trained on skin like mine, which is absolutely ludicrous. 
But again, it's a reflection of what the business has always looked like, right? If the business has always been white, then the, quali the qualification is always going to be uh, doing hair and makeup on somebody who's white, mm. right? And meanwhile, when you have, I mean, and half the time, that would be my frustration specifically in the area of hair and makeup, because nine times out of 10, if you hire a person of color to do the hair and makeup, they are actually able to do that make hair and makeup on, on someone of color and on somebody white. So in a way, they're actually more qualified, <laughs> but yes. it means nothing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it makes absolutely no sense because they can't just only have their training on textured hair and colored skin. Absolutely not. They have to be able to do white faces. They need to do more. You know, it's the baseline of what makes them qualified. Mm -hmm. So it's just like the follow through has to be there. Absolutely. I mean, in terms of, um, you know, in terms of the directors that you work with as well, um, you know, I found it very interesting to learn. Actually, just this past week, there's been some, you know, further commitments in terms of Europe and the situation here, specifically for, you know, women behind the, you know, yeah. the female directors. Um, and, you know, it's one in five directors in Europe is, you know, is, is a woman working on productions, which is, which is absolutely shocking. Is this something that you are thinking more consciously about when you're choosing your project, projects? And especially the, the roles that you've taken on have been so yeah. specific. Is that, does it, is that going through your head these days? I mean, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, you know, in a business, the more work you do and the more people like the work you do, then sort of the more agency you have and mm -hmm. who you get to work with. And, and you know, my whole thing is that I, I want to make my life about not only just working with incredible directors, but working with women, working with women of color, you know, using the opportunities that I have to give opportunities to people that are not, are being, that, where the industry is being gatekept to them, you know, or that are not being given the level of respect that they deserve when they're extremely talented, you know. But it's that same thing, you know, people use the excuse, I'm sure the excuse is, well, there are not that many female directors. Mm. And it's like, the reality is there are very many talented female directors, but again, when you don't have the opportunity, and you're not given the opportunity, then that door isn't opened for you. And so then it's like, oh, suddenly, oh, where are they? But it's like, they haven't been allowed in. They haven't been allowed in. Yeah. And when they're allowed in, and then they screw up, they're not, they don't get the second chance. Well, then that's the other thing. I feel yeah. like, you know, with Me Too, when then what you saw is, suddenly they were like, let's give an opportunity to a female director, mm. you know, and it was not about, it was just, you know, it was more about, let me just do this thing and, and, it, and let me just give this opportunity and then it's like, we're waiting for it to fail. And so then we can say, well, it doesn't work, see. Right. Mm. Yeah, of course, <laughs> there's a lot of that. You know? We've seen it, you know, at film festivals as well. Like and then it's like, and the other thing that I see very much is opportunities are given to female filmmakers, opportunities are given to f filmmakers of color, and then they are not supported by the studio. Mm. They're not supported with the money, they're not supported with the resources, they're not supported in any way. And so they're fighting to get what they're, they're doing done. You know, and you're just like, how does that make sense? Where is the, 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 the language about being an ally? What happened to that? Because that means the whole way, with your money, and your time, and your resources. 100%. Would you, would you consider directing at some point? Or? I have already directed something. I, I directed a short film last year yeah. that I did. Um, it's called Jackie. You can watch it online. It's on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I wrote it. I directed it. I, uh, I costume designed it. I directed it. It was, it was incredible to do that process and it just really was something that made me see like okay here's another path that I definitely want to explore and see what's there for me because I just loved it so much and I think you know as an actor you're always a part of something where you know it's all the other voices and you are taking everything around you and channeling that and and making something and when you sort of sit in the director's seat and you have your hand in everything I mean it was really incredible to have that process, you know, sitting in the edit for hours, sitting in the color grade for hours, like all of that stuff and, and making all of the decisions. And I mean, it's, it's intoxicating. Wow. <laughs> so, you, so, you, so you're open to more? Like, are you? Are oh, you... absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah, no. And I'm actually directing uh, a music video next for uh, my friend's band, Gabriel's. It's really amazing band, Gabriel's. And for their next single, 
when I get back, I'll be directing their music video. Back in, back to the US. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Okay. So that's going to be my next project. I'm very, very excited about it. Is it is it easy to transition from being sort of you know such a high profile actor as you are into into directing? Like, I mean, do what what is that like? How do you how do those conversations pan out? I feel like it's more you know, again, the more people that uh, the more opportunity that sort of doing good work or work that people some people at least <laughs> feel is good, uh, allows you to have a certain kind of respect and then suddenly people are willing to help you get something done, <laughs> which is really great. You know, now you're like, well, this is what I want to do. And, and then also just all the relationships I think that I built from I started until now, it's, everything just kind of came together so perfectly that when it came time that I was ready to make something, I had all of these incredibly talented people around me to support me in getting it made. Mm -hmm. You know, which is what you need. You need support. To make anything you need support, <laughs> you, it's, it's, it's so difficult to do it without. Totally. And really, that's what it comes down to. And I think it's less about, okay, I'm an actor and I'm transitioning into doing that. And it's more about being creative, I feel. You know, it's like when, once you decide that you just want to make art, you know, then it just manifests in all the different ways. And, and if you're lucky to have people around you to support you in getting that done, then it gets done very quickly. If you don't have support, it takes a lot longer. It takes a lot longer. But you get it done because you persevere because that's what we do, right? Mm -hmm. We do. Um, in terms of in terms of setting up, you know, a wider entity, like what about a production company that would sort of then you are able to kind of Absolutely. be a bit more have more agency in terms of picking out your roles and, and helping other new talent as well? Is that is that on the cards? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, producing things that I'm not even, I'm not in, you know, just things that I pushing forward stories that I find to be fascinating and interesting and, and giving opportunities to other people and, and, and to actors and to directors that I'm obsessed with and, and that, that are not being given the stage that they need to be given to. I mean, I, I hope to do all of those things. You know, I feel like what's really amazing about this business is in a way there are really no limits to what you can create. I think that's one of the most magical things about it. I mean, as an actor, you can be anybody. You know, and as a storyteller, you can tell any story, any story that you want. And that's really, 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 really incredible. And in terms of your next projects as well, what do you, what do you sort of have, have coming up? Obviously, After Yang is an amazing film. Yeah. And that's an interesting, I mean, we should, we should talk about that because um, yes, Coconada. Please. Because yes. he's so amazing and talented, Coconada. I just, I'm literally, and I feel like this keeps happening to me, but I just, you know, because I'm just, Number one, I'm just so happy to be here and to be involved, you know, and I'm so happy to be being asked to be a part of things. I feel so lucky to get to work with some of these filmmakers that I've worked with, and I'm just like, oh, my God, I can't believe I'm, I'm here doing this. Like, <laughs> 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 But Koganada is just such an incredibly talented writer and director and just, like, visual artist. I mean, it's... I to watch it again and obviously to watch it obviously in this context at this festival which I, this is my first time coming here I've never been here before was just overwhelming and to see how you know when you're a part of something and you you see your small part of it you know especially as an actor you know your part of it is the story is the script but then there are all these other things that go into bringing this thing to life and to watch and see like this is the vision of you know to feel number one you know, when I did that, I felt so much trust in him as a storyteller. And then to see it on the screen, I'm like, yeah. Absolutely. And it, it, I was just thinking in terms of, it was such a seamless exercise in, in just representation, wasn't it? I mean, in terms yeah. of, you know, obviously his, his background, but also, you know, the... I, I just loved how international the story was. Yeah. You know, you and Colin Farrell are obviously a couple. You have um, an adopted daughter who's who's Chinese, yeah. and there is sort of a, I guess like a, um, uh, like a like an like an android effectively Yang who, yeah. you know, has you've you've bought, bought this android to be. It's it's set in the future, by the way. <laughs> like um, I guess the near yeah near it future. Just, it was just a very naturalistic way to create a world and to show that a world that is diverse. Is can feel just so easy, mm -hmm. <laughs> and also that in this world of diversity, we're not just saying everybody is the same. We're actually having a conversation about bringing people together that are different. 
you know, there's a, a particular scene in that film, the tree grafting scene, that I just really yes. just had me absolutely in tears as I was watching the film. But that it's just such a beautiful telling of how, you know, you can bring diverse people together and turn them into a family. But the new family is just as what, what is just as important as the new family is where is the old family. You know, it's about honoring every part of someone's identity, even as they come to make something brand new. And that, I think, is just so special and beautiful and poignant and important. Totally. Yeah. And so after Yang, after, after Yang, after, 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 Yang, after Yang, what yeah. are, you know, what's, what's coming up for you? What's next? Yeah, so right now what I'm working on is, is, a, is a Noah Baumbach film, <laughs> White Noise, uh, which is based on a Don... With Adam novel. Driver. Yeah, with Adam Driver and Greta Gerwig and Don Cheadle. And I'm really very excited for that. You know, it's, 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 it feels really cool when you get to be a part of something with a director that you really respect and admire and who you know it has a vision. Again, it's like, I mean, when you walk onto a set and you know that you're walking on to be a part of a vision of somebody who is just extremely talented and it's just like there's something that's so humbling and wonderful about that exciting because it's like wow there's so much to learn here and then when you get to work with actors that are so incredibly talented it's just like again it makes me it always makes me think back to my experience on Mad Dogs in that same way where it's just like this is about now going onto this set and just learning from everybody around me. And honestly, it's how I approach every set. It's like, again, it's having that idea, who will I be at the end of this experience? What will I have learned? How will I grow? You know, and I'm just so excited for that. You know? That's brilliant. I'm so excited to, for you and to be in a Noah Baumbach film again. Yeah, me too. It's just like everything And it's you great do. because, you know, Noah's worlds are generally very white. Yes. So it feels very good to be bringing some color to those worlds and to be working with a filmmaker who's, who's actually saying, because I feel like, you know, there are a lot of filmmakers who make very white worlds who are still making those very white worlds and just making sort of tokenistic choices. And it feels good to be a part of inhabiting a character who is a three-dimensional person in these worlds and for bringing some of these storytellers into a very new and real and diverse reality. Have you had that, like, have you had that conversation with Noah Baumbach? Like, does he speak openly like, about, Noah, like, how... Noah, your world's very white. Uh, no, <laughs> I haven't had that conversation with Noah, but I think Noah knows. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I think I, I'm, I'm excited to honor the fact that I think when, I think when white filmmakers want to meet us in a space where they're saying, like, I'm doing this and I'm not doing this in a place of being tokenistic mm. or being, you know, a performing allyship, I love to meet them in the space of just honoring that. And it's like, we don't have to have a conversation where we hit each other over the head with it. We get to just meet each other here and respect and honor this. And, like, for me, like, that's what this is. That's brilliant. Yeah. Um, okay, I think we have some audience questions, um, and then we also have um, a couple of questions from um, the caring, caring social media. So I see a lady up here who's been. What? And could you say your question? Then I will actually repeat it. it say your question, then I will repeat it for for Jody as well. So how do you, the question is, how do you use your voice to, to raise um, further opportunities for, for others in the industry? Is that effectively it? Got it, personally as well. Yeah, no, you know, I think for me, I'm very conscious about this idea that I want my daughter to not feel, number one, as women, I feel like we're always, we are taught, we're conditioned to apologize for our existence, for being in the space. And I want her to understand that she doesn't have to do that, that she belongs, that she can speak her voice, so that she can be fully present in a situation and not feel like she needs to apologize for her existence. 
And I think that my hope is that in my life, through my living, through the art that I create, through the way that I create my art, that this is something that I live by example, that she grows up seeing and is modeled for her. You know, because obviously we can try to teach each other things, but as a parent, as you, we know that the, the biggest way we teach our children is by how we live, by how they see us live, by how they see us respond to other people, by how they see us take in what other people tell us. When people limit us, how do we respond to that? Do we have limiting conversations about ourselves? Do we show up in smallness in the world? Or do we show up in all of our large splendor, unafraid to let people know that we're here to take up space? Amazing. And your daughter is a, a year, just over a year old? Yes, she's just over one, yeah. Incredible. Um, I, do we have any other, other questions as well from the audience? Um, I will move on to the... I guess I talked so much that nobody has... We've covered a lot of ground. <laughs> They're like, no, please, stop her. She said enough. <laughs> we have covered a lot of down ground, that is, that is to be sure. Um, okay, so these are questions from Caring's uh, social media, okay. which, I will, which I will read out. If you could talk to the six-year-old version of yourself, what would you say to her? I would say to her, don't be afraid to take up space. And I would say to her, your complexion is beautiful. And you might not know it now, but you will. <laughs> That's lovely. Um, and what are you most proud of? What am I most proud of? I'm most proud of having an attitude that says, I don't know everything, and I have so much to learn. Because I think that alone allows me to resist stagnation, to resist my ego, to resist any of those things that limit me. So yeah. That is very refreshing in this industry, <laughs> <laughs> I have to say. Um, absolutely. Well, I, I think that we are, um, we are at time. Does anybody have any other, any other questions? Um, Okay, brilliant. Well, I just want to say thank you so much, Jodi, for this conversation. Thank you. Thank you.